Hi friends. So today I'll start lecture 10 in our aerospace engineering class. And today I'm going to discuss the low speed wind tunnel and also a device known as the manometer. I am Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now, the wind tunnel typically has a schematic as shown in this figure. So there is a region where the wind essentially speeds up or the air speeds up and this is known as the contraction cone. There's a test section which is placed somewhere in the middle and towards the later part of the wind tunnel there is something known as a diffuser. So again the air slows down here. So the air comes in from the front and leaves from the back side of the wind tunnel. So essentially the wind tunnel is an experimental facility where we subject a test section to air flow. So for example, the test section is shown here as an airfoil section. It could be a wing section, it could be a model of an aircraft, it could be a model of a car, of a ship or any particular specimen which you are subjecting to various forces which come because of the air flow. Now, the wind tunnel is typically used to measure pressure and forces. So again, if you are able to measure the pressure distribution on a certain body, you can calculate the forces which act on it through integration. Now, how do we generate this airflow? It is essentially done by putting fans at the end of the wind tunnel or at the back side of the wind tunnel. And so what happens is that the air is pulled in front and then it is thrown out from this side. So let us look at some of the values for the different point properties at different points at the wind tunnel. So in front we have the velocity V1, pressure P1 and the cross section is A1. At the test section location we have velocity V2, pressure P2 and cross section A2. And at the end of the wind tunnel we have velocity V3, pressure P3 and the cross section is A3. Now, we want to get some concepts about what is the relationship between the different point properties at the different section. So immediately we can apply the continuity equation because no mass is being put into this wind tunnel system. So essentially we can consider this entire thing to be like a stream tube and there is no mass going in or out of the system. So the continuity equation can be applied between points 1, 2 and 3. So the continuity equation here simply becomes A1 V1 equals A2 V2 equals A3 V3 and here we are assuming this is a low speed wind tunnel so there is incompressible flow so the density is constant throughout. So density does not come into the continuity equation. Now from the continuity equation I can immediately calculate the velocity v2 at the test section. So v2 is going to be a1 by a2 into v1 and also if I want I can calculate the velocity v3 towards the end of the wind tunnel and that's going to be a2 by a3 into v2. Now certain facts you can essentially get about this wind tunnel shape from this equation. For example we clearly see that a2 is typically smaller than a1 so since a2 is smaller than a1 from this formula here we are going to see that v2 is going to be greater than v1 so what this means is that the flow speeds up in the contraction zone so that is why this is a contraction zone and this kind of shape helps the flow to speed up and essentially we have a higher speed flow as it passes through the test section and similarly as the flow goes out here in this diffuser section you can see that what happens is that A3 is typically greater than A2 as is shown here in this picture A3 is greater than A2 and therefore V3 is going to be less than V2 so flow slows down in the diffuser section so these are certain things to remember so typically the low speed wind tunnel looks like this there is a contraction cone sometime also known as a reservoir there is a location here where the test section is placed and then there is a diffuser zone here where the flow again slows down 
So since we are considering incompressible flow, we can easily apply the Bernoulli's equation also at these three points. So if we do that, we get the equation P1 plus half rho V1 square equals P2 plus half rho V2 square equals P3 plus half rho V3 square. So I have applied Bernoulli's equation at the front of the wind tunnel, at the test section, and at the exit of the wind tunnel. So these three points. And the reason for this is that we are going to calculate V2 from these equations here because we want to know what's the velocity at the point where the test section is placed. So that's something very important because we want to know all the different parameters at that point. So from the Bernoulli's equation, we can take the first two parts of this equation, the one involving point one and point two. And if I subtract these two, I can immediately obtain the expression for V2 square. So V2 square would simply come by taking this P2 to the left-hand side and then multiplying by two by rho, which is done here. So V2 square is two by rho into P1 minus P2 plus V1 square. So the next thing I do is I need to remove this V1 square term and to do that, I essentially can express this V1 in terms of V2 by using the continuity equation, which I derived in the previous slide. So if I do that, I get this term here. So essentially V1 square would become V2 square into A2 by A1 square. So I substitute this here. So I've got the V2 squared terms on both sides of this equation. And then after some simplification, I obtain this equation here that V2 is the square root of 2 P1 minus P2 divided by rho 1 minus A2 by A1 square. Now, do remember in any wind tunnel, we will typically know the values of A2 and A1 from geometry. We also know rho, which is the density of air at the location where the wind tunnel is there. And so what we would need to know is P1 minus P2. If we know that, we can estimate the value of V2 or the velocity at the test section. So just to recapitulate this, again, the wind tunnel is drawn here. We need to find this velocity V2 at the test section. And to do this, I need to find P1 minus P2 because A2 by A1 and rho are typically known for a given wind tunnel. So this P1 minus P2 is actually calculated by a certain device, which we are going to discuss next. So before we move on that, let us formulate a certain concept of a virtual measurement. So here what happens is that the thing we are actually going to measure is P1 minus P2 that is measured physically. And then V2 is calculated using this formula. So this is known as a virtual sensor. And this virtual sensor will essentially give us the value of V2 if we are able to calculate P1 minus P2. So part of the sensor is actually working from physics and part of the sensor is actually working from the mathematical formula. So the device which lets us calculate P1 minus P2 is known as the manometer. So here I have shown a schematic of the manometer. So as you can see, it is filled with a certain liquid, which I have shown in blue here. This liquid has density D, and therefore I can immediately write some equation here. So if we have one part of the manometer or one face of the manometer connected to a certain pressure, that pressure could be P2. The second part is connected to a different pressure. That pressure is P1. And the cross section here is A in both cases. And let's assume that P1 is greater than P2. So if that happens, this liquid is going to get pushed in this manner here because P1 is greater than P2. And so we can write this equation as follows, that P1 into A, that's the force on this part here of the liquid, is equal to P2A, which is this force, plus H A D G. So H into A would be the volume of this liquid here. If we multiply this volume by density, we get the mass. And if we multiply the mass by gravity, G, 9.81 meter per second square, then we get the force here. So this is nothing but a force balance equation on the manometer.
now i immediately can remove this a on both sides because this a is the same this is a uniform tube and therefore i get the value that p1 minus p2 is h dg so immediately if i were to know the values of d and g from the density of the liquid and the gravity of the planet you are in all we need to do is we need to measure h and from there i can calculate p1 minus p2 now you could use many different fluids here so in the olden days typically mercury was used mercury has a density which is very high 13950 kg per meter cube but there are some issues with mercury in terms of toxicity and so on so sometimes water is also used water has a much lower density so again you would need a different size of manometer there and in some cases where freezing is a problem one can also use kerosene so these are certain situations which can actually happen so now what's done is that one end of the manometer is connected to the reservoir or this part which will essentially make it sense p1 and the second end is connected to the test section which is going to sense p2 and then what's going to happen is that we are going to measure h and from the density of the liquid and the value of g we can immediately calculate the test section speed which is v2 so essentially this equation and this equation are identical once the manometer is used and therefore the manometer can be used to find out what is the velocity at the wind tunnel test section so today's class we learned several things one of the things is that the wind tunnel is an experimental device which is used to measure pressure and thus forces which act on a test section and many different bodies or institutions have wind tunnel for example the different institutions which work on an aircraft they typically have wind tunnel sometimes some universities may also have wind tunnels now the continuity and Bernoulli equations get used here and again we are considering low speed flow and no mass is put in no energy is put in inside that wind tunnel so we can use this equation to get the flow field the manometer was used to measure the pressure difference and through that the velocity at the test section and wind tunnels are required because you need to verify fluid mechanics predictions whether you are making them through the use of mathematical models or in some cases computational fluid dynamics so nowadays there are very powerful computational tools of solving the equations such as the Euler equation the Navier-Stokes equation and so on and they will give you certain solutions of the fluid flow and that will help you figure out the different pressures velocities and so on but even then you actually need to finally test things in wind tunnel so that you can verify that the flight vehicle when it is actual made will fly properly the loads are appropriate and so on so computational fluid dynamics also known as cfd has greatly reduced the cost of lot of problem so in some cases you can do what is known as virtual tests or numerical tests but the wind tunnel is finally something which we do need to use to check the veracity of anything coming out of cft so that was the lecture for today so i think you got a good concept about the wind tunnel and also you learned about how the continuity and bernoulli equation can be used very usefully in the wind tunnel system and we also learned about the manometer so i'll end this video here and i will see you in my next lecture sometime soon see you then